Vamos a dar inicio a nuestra segunda, segundo día de actividades de la segunda semana de Ciencias de la Complejidad. En esta ocasión tenemos a el doctor Hiroki Sayama, que viene de la Universidad de Binghamton, State University of New York, y va a presentar el tema Self-Organization of Morphogenic Collective Systems. Le cedo la palabra. Vamos a tener transmisión en vivo de su presentación. Can you hear me okay? All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the organizers for having us, uh, including me, as a speaker to this great event. Uh, my name is Hiroki Sayama. Uh, I'm a basically a computer scientist uh, by training, but I have been doing lots of complex systems research uh, all over the place in the scientific disciplines. Uh, mostly I work with social uh, organizational modeling with social scientists and some theoretical modeling of network analysis, uh, network uh, multi-layer networks and adaptive networks. Those are kind of main research areas uh, I work uh, on nowadays. But I just ask the Carlos, what kind of talk I should give in this uh, event? He just said you know, something flashy and something I, you know, you know, that attracts people's attention. So he suggested maybe I should present something related to swarm simulation, because that's where I originally came from. I, my original research area uh, still is is the artificial life, and I hope many people now know what the artificial life is. It's not quite pure science. It's not quite pure computer science. It's more like a philosophy, art, and uh, you know any kind of logical uh, deep inquiries about life. What is life? So today I'm going to talk about this thing, morphogenetic collective systems. And first of all, I need to define what this is, because I hear many people get confused. Okay, because you are saying genetic, so this must be related to genetics in biology. And my answer is obviously no. <laughs> The morphogenesis is a, the original word. Morphogenesis really means the morpho is the shape, right? And genesis means production. So this simply means that uh, shape is being produced by collective system. Collective means that they, we are now considering a very large number of interacting system, uh, interacting agents. And then the, finally, we are not really looking at the biological phenomena or physical phenomena. Instead, we just want to look at mathematical, computational, abstract systems. So everything we, uh, I talk about in this talk today has nothing to do with biology. I'm going to make a f first disclaimer. Instead, we'd like to explore so what would be the potential connection between microscopic behavior rules in, you introduce to the abstract systems and what kind of macroscopic patterns, self-organization, shapes, dynamical behaviors you can uh, get. and. Uh, the conceptual gap between those microscopic rules and the macroscopic outcome is one of the key uh, areas of inquiry and exploration that we are trying to do in artificial life, right? So that's the basic disclaimer, right? Even though you see some of the behavior might look like a biology, this is coming from the artificial system, right? And uh, I keep speaking like this, so please feel free to stop me and ask any question at any time. So I would like to make this more like a fun uh, session, especially the first talk in the morning after the, you know, the really nice dinner that Laura and the, her husband that took us to you know, some nice place. And then I came back to my hotel past midnight. So I want to make this talk act as active as possible. Otherwise, I might fall down in of the environment. Anyway, so the most important slide is this. So the, everything I talk about today is already available in the preprint. So you can, now is the time to take a picture. Thank you for taking a picture. <laughs> Download the preprint. This will be uh, showing up in the proceedings of the, some, the, com uh, the conference satellite symposium organized last year. It's now on archive, right? Now, now you've got the most important information. You can fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> so the basic motivation is this. In complex system science, uh, in a, at least in the traditional sense, there are several canonical models that people tend to use. For example, this, what happened? Oh, it's still up. Okay, you can look at that one. Okay. This is the typical bird flocking model. Uh, the, one of the famous models are created by Craig Reynolds back in 1987. And uh, there are some interaction rules here. And the, every agent 
adopt the same kind of behavior, and you see that the really nice-looking swarming behavior showing up. Another example, ant foraging. So the ants will deposit some kind of the pheromones to communicate between each other to try to optimize the foraging time and resource. And the same uh, thing applies here. This is more like an ant colony optimization. And the more recently, network analysis, you create a model of the topology of some system, try to understand how uh, things are structured. So those are all the canonical ways of creating a model of complex system. However, if you compare these typical traditional complex system models to the reality, we see some differences, right? So this is the, the embryo of the firefly. This is a very famous picture. I think this won some, uh, the Science Communication Award. I, ex I forgot exactly what it is. But you see, we are spatial patterns. We are the multicellular organisms. And, and each one of the cells in your body, my body, they are different from each other, fundamentally different. They differentiate into different cell types, although they can switch from one type to the other occasionally, and then they communicate by using some more detailed uh, signals, uh, more like a symbolic signals, like a chemical pheromones, other uh, uh, things. So you definitely have some heterogeneous shape here. And this is the termite nest building. So termites actually create a very organic structure, and then uh, they communicate uh, with each other uh, in a very uh, complicated way to coordinate their behaviors. They also differentiate somehow uh, to play different roles in the nest. So it's more like a society, like what we live here, right? So this is the picture of Tokyo, but I was impressed by looking at the landscape of the Mexico City. So this is really, yeah. This one? This is the embryo, the, uh, the firefly. The, the, uh, several weeks later, you start from the single cell, right? They divide and grow, and eventually you see this kind of form, the multicellular structure. And these different colors represent different genes, proteins expressed. You see, you, know, you already start to see some sect, uh, segmentation of the body. Yeah, this part should be the abdomen. This should be the head, blah, 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 right? Okay. So I see some gaps between mathematically nice, uh, homogeneous, uh, you know, uh, Drosophila. Yeah, this is Drosophila, by the way, yes. So, yeah. So, nice uh, canonical complex system models versus the reality we are actually embedded. So for example, we are heterogeneous, obviously, right? Not in a simple dynamical state sense, but in more general. We are, I guess, the majority sitting here are the ac academic researchers, which is very different from other professions. So you take some time to get the training to become one of the professions. So that's more like a differentiation process taking place in human society. Same thing applies here. The cells are differentiating, or the individual in termite nest, they are also differentiating, and they communicate with each other in a very sophisticated way. And those heterogeneity is, I think, one of the key ingredients we need to bring more actively into the complex systems inquiry. So that's the motivation. So what we are uh, trying to do is to uh, create a, some abstract system that captures the essence that I mentioned, heterogeneity, differentiation and dynamic communication between agents, and then try to create some systematic uh, research program that you can change the parameters uh, in the sense that you can actually explore different types of complexities of the model classes so that we can discuss what would be the implications of each of those new features you add to the system. The first part is to define the complexity classes. So here, this is just arbitrary choice. We have to start with something. So we started by defining four different classes of such morphogenetic uh, collective system. One is the, the simplest possible example. You have a bunch of uh, individual agents. They are essentially the, following the same behavior rules. They are homogenous. We call class A, the basic one, like a uh, boys. That's a class A, because all the individuals follow the same direct, uh, behavior rules. Two, uh, you can introduce multiple types of agents. So this is the A plus some heterogeneity. So now you see the diff fundamental different types mixing together. So that's a class B. Class C is, in addition to the heterogeneity, now you can also allow individuals to switch from one type to another, right? 
So like the, we can give up our job as uh, the faculty or the graduate student, you can jump into the finance, you know, which is much more lucrative, right? So you may want to consider doing that. So that's actually the differentiation or redifferentiation. And the many biological you know, uh, or social systems have that kind of feature. The individual is not uh, you know, set in the stone, so they actually can change. And finally, the class D is that this kind of behavior can be driven by symbolic information exchange. It's not a physical contact. More like, you know, one agent try to transmit some information intentionally to others, and the pheromones would be the definitely one uh, symbolic expression. It's a molecular language, right? So we use, you know, natural language like this, and the many insects and animals also communicate uh, by using symbolic languages. And those are kind of examples here. So by creating this kind of conceptual framework, you see that the A, B, C, D actually form the nested structure. You know, in order to uh, have a class C, for example, you need to be at least a class B, and uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. So mathematically speaking, uh, if you take some uh, dynamical systems type of the representation, the class A is really a simplistic dynamical model. So here you have the next action of the individual is given by some kind of state transition function F, which takes the current uh, input coming from the environment. So this is the observation, right? So this is a typical thing, like a cell automata could be considered like this, and many other canonical models can be considered, an input and output, and everybody follows the same behavior rules. And if you allow individual to take multiple different types, now the function actually depends on your type. Right? So this is class B. Now the system is heterogeneous fundamentally. And you can also include not only the actions, but also the states can also dynamically change. So this will be the type transition. So this now you have two different functions. And finally, you can also include neighbors, uh, whatever means. The, the agents are connected to neighbors, e either spatially or the, on networks, and that they can also share that information. So that would be the most complex uh, <coughs> mathematical model to represent the, the collective system. So we created this kind of framework and try to come up with some meaningful ways to computational study, how their behavior is going to be different. Okay. So as I said, I've been working on the swarm models for quite uh, some time, uh, primarily just for fun. But in order to get some funding, you need to have some sophistication. So we used Swarm chemistry to, as a tool to you know, study this kind of the fundamental grandiose biological question. So here we are. The swarm chemistry is already fundamental heterogeneous system. So when I published the very first paper about swarm chemistry back in 2009, it belonged to class B. It didn't really have any differentiation or communication capability. So we extended the model assumptions later on to make it uh, more, more for genetics, so that they can dif differentiate and redifferentiate dynamically uh, based on some communication. So, as many of you have already know, probably, uh, this model is based on the Reynolds Boyd's model. So, here you have uh, some space, each agent uh, you know, has some interaction range, and then they follow primarily uh, the three uh, kinetic interaction rules cohesion tries to you know, keep the population aggregated. Alignment uh, makes the each particle to align its direction along with the, its neighbors. And the final separation tries to avoid any collision. That's a basic model. In the original swarm chemistry model, it already has multiple types of parameter settings within the single population. So this is what we call the recipe. In this case, for example, what happens if you uh, blend in 93 of these individuals? 38 of these, blah, blah, blah. So you have the one cup of flour, one cup of sugar, the two cups of butter, mix them together, you get some fancy pastry. So essentially the same idea. What uh, we did was to create heterogeneous types and then blend them together and to see what happens. So that was the original swarm chemistry. Okay. And you can see. Oh, okay, so these are the parameter values for uh, use for the simulation of the each movement. And uh, I'm gonna skip the details, but maybe those three would be the most important. Each number represents the strength of cohesion rule, alignment rule, and separation rules. Okay, yeah, but in this model, 
each individual agent is stupid. They don't really have any fancy sensors or anything. They just follow exactly the same rules, but with different behavior signatures. However, purely because of physical interaction, they start to show the spontaneous self-organization, so uh, segregation. Uh, so for example, here is the one uh, example. So you see a bunch of simulation runs. So here you see two patterns. They are created from heti uh, homogeneous uh, recipe. They are made of the single type. And then what you are seeing in the third window is what is going to happen if you blend them together. And here, this is a Monte Carlo simulation. You see a bunch of examples. But you notice, even without any sensor, those particles can spontaneously segregate. This is pretty much because of the difference of personal space, right? Uh, you go to international conferences, sometimes you see the attendants coming from different culture. You notice that his personal space is different from mine. And he, me, I feel uncomfortable. I'm going to step back. And then suddenly, those two particles start to create you know, emergent motion. That's essentially the idea. So that's the, you know, what's happening here, right? So, but this is fun, but this is also kind of known already. So more interesting thing here is that only having the heterogeneous pattern, you can create a really dynamic pattern, uh, which is emergent, purely coming from the interaction. So here are the, some examples. All of those six examples are listed at the top, they don't move if you simulate them alone. For example, here, if you blend these two together, this is the outcome. Keep in mind, each type never moves by the, uh, itself. But only because you blend them together, you start to see some mechanical motion coming up. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict why this kind of the circular motion happens. Okay, another example is more like a physical oscillation. So this one, oh, sorry. Maybe I should show this one. Ah, come on. Yes. So this one is more sticky. You see that one particle is trying to go out. Well, I don't even know if it's trying to go out, but it's coming back. And then you see that there's some loose oscillatory behavior created by the interaction between those two types. So this is already a good indication that you know, having the heterogeneity already creates a lot more diverse behavior structure than the single uh, types. This is B or something? Yes, go ahead. This is already B, yeah. Oh, that's a great question, yes. Could you no, repeat that the question? The, the influence of boundaries in initial conditions. Yes, so they do matter a lot. And the initial configuration is, in this case, it's a random, and most of the time, this kind of self-organized patterns are quite robust. Uh, it doesn't really matter specifically to the initial positioning, but we also discovered that the certain recipes are very sensitive and that they may even have bias stability. Sometimes it falls into one attractor, some, uh, some other times it falls into another structure. So that is actually possible, right? Bound there's no boundary here, so it's in open space. Sometimes you see the patterns are actually dispersing. But again, if you put the fixed boundary, it also significantly affects the self-organization uh, process. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I think I'm speaking too much. Still the introduction. <laughs> yeah. So what do we do? So this is up to class B, and we want to expand this into class C and D, right? So in order to do that, we need to have some expansion from the original swarm chemistry model. So this is more recent work. We included some uh, observation vector that each particle can receive. So in this case, this particle senses some locally measurable quantities. Uh, like this is the, the uh, how spread the, the spatial pattern is. This is the velocity ratio. And here you see uh, absolute velocity, blah, blah, blah. This is arbitrary. You can define uh, any, any combinations of local measurements. And you also encode what is the current state current dynamical type this pattern has. And then this vector can be utilized as the decision-making process of each individual, right? So, and then we created some uh, simplistic mathematical formula. Here you define uh, what is called the preference weight matrix. This is given by the experimenter, me. And each particle receives a vector as an input. Depending on the result of the multiplication here, 
it decides whether or not it's going to stay in the current profession, or maybe we should quit our job and then move to the finance, right? So that's the idea. So this allows the each swarm particles to differentiate and redifferentiate dynamically. Okay. Moreover, in order to represent the class D, we need to have some information sharing also taking place among the local neighbors. So we introduce a really simplistic assumption here. It's called the local information sharing coefficient W. So if this is zero, this pie chart is occupied by the only the individual agent's own observation uh, vector. If this is one, the each agent uh, basically ignores its own observation. It, instead, it always listens to its neighbors. What is the local average you know, observations? And then follow whatever others say. And you can adjust this parameter you know, from between zero and one to make the model uh, talking to each other or not talking to each other. So that's the one way of parameterizing the class differences. So after all, by making those changes, we can put four different classes into the really nice parameterized space. So here, this is type A, only the single homogeneous type. Using the multiple types in the recipe makes the model to B, and then setting non-zero matrix U makes a class C, and then setting the non-zero W makes a class D. So now we have more science-y setup. We can do the Monte Carlo simulation, yes. Showing here is all deterministic, am I right? Or, do you also, or can you also include here some probabilistic component to this? It's actually part of the behavioral uh, rule. So you saw that the recipe numbers, right? I think the last number was how much stochasticity each particle has. If the, the, that part, uh, parameter value was zero, it's purely deterministic. If that value is high, the particle actually has a lot of noise. So that is already included in the model. Thank you. Right? Any other questions? All right. Okay. So what we did was, uh, you don't have to read this. We did a bunch of simulations. Uh, generate random uh, matrices, the coefficient, and you throw into the simulation app. Run the simulation for certain steps. You measure the outcome, right? And then if you do this for a bunch of steps, you can see how the complexity affects the development. Here's the results. A, B, C, D, you see the final pattern, and obviously we have no idea what's happening. <laughs> Just curious, do you see any pattern differences? It's rather hard to see, right? Well, one simple conclusion is A is homogeneous, obviously, by definition, so you see the patterns are a little bit less excite exciting than the others, right? But the differences between B, C, and D, it's very difficult to just to, uh, you know, uh, visually detect any differences. We need to have some more quantifiable uh, measurements. So what we did is this. First, we measured uh, the bunch of kinetic outcomes, like speed or the average absolute speed, blah, 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 uh, the rotational motion. Uh, I don't even remember what we measured. So a bunch of stuff from the time series data of their positions, right? And we can also create topological information as well. This is more useful when you want to study the shapes or patterns. Specifically, what we did was to convert this kind of spatial pattern into a graph. And once you convert the spatial pattern into a network, you can detect lots of the network topological information here. So I'm going to skip the details. This is what we did, but because we are running out of time. So here's one example. Okay. This is the real simulation. This is the, the reconstructed network. I think this simulation comes from class D. So eventually, they talk to each other and then they assimilate to create a homogeneous pattern. But it's not originally from homogeneous. This homogenization took place because of communication between the agents. Let me run one more time so that you can see behavior. Okay. Initially, it was heterogeneous. You see these patterns here, right? But they talk to each other. And then network topology also changes quite drastically. So this is just a single simulation. We ran a lot of uh, the simulation here for the class A, B, C, and D. Okay. So here's the result. <laughs> Always the, the looking at the simulation is nice, but seeing the table is boring, right? So these are the, the all the measurements we took. 
temporal mean and temporal standard deviation. This means that the actual count, this is the fluctuation. And here you have class A, B, C, D, and then the highlighted in yellow, they are the positive than the normal. The highlight in the cyan blue is the negative. But, you know, I don't, obviously, we don't have time to interpret this, so I can give you some quick tour. First of all, if the system is homogeneous, they don't show dynamic fluctuation. They tend to settle down in the more or less static pattern, and then it's way more static than the class B or C or D. So having heterogeneous differences between agents actually makes the system more agitated, dynamically moving over time. Second, the, there's a huge difference between class B and the class C or D in terms of the distance measurement. So that means that if the system is heterogeneous, there's a the greater chance that the system actually, you know, sp spread out, disperse, right? They move into different uh, areas and then the system gets, you know, more like an explosive behavior than the class C and class D. Class C and class D tend to uh, you know, they are more agreeable because of the information sharing. Eventually, they're going to create the more the co spatially coherent structure. So those are kind of the initial observation we can make. Okay. We also did some the principal component analysis to reduce those 24-dimensional feature space to uh, see more interesting pattern here. Well, these are also the boring stuff, so I'm going to skip this. You know, we detect some of the really interpretable principal components. But here are the, some behavioral signatures of the class A, B, C, and D, and then plotted over the three principal components of features. But still, it's kind of hard to see if there's any difference between B, C, and D, right? And what was a little bit disappointing to us initially was that we thought the class C and the class D should be more sophisticated, more advanced than class D, because it actually has more abilities. But the results we get so far is a little bit uh, boring because class C and D is actually closer to class A. Class B, the heterogeneous one, without any communication, they created the most aggressive behavior. So we want to find out, okay, what is the difference between those? So we did a little bit more mathematical uh, characterization. So we measured the behavior diversities created by the class D and C and D. So using some of the measurement, here are the, what we did. These particles are not the actual agent. This is the, each dot is a simulation result, okay? Embedded in the 24 dimensional feature space we measured from the experiment. The first thing we can measure is that simply we take the approximation of the, how much behavior space was occupied by the collections of the simulation. So this is the behavioral coverage we can measure for each class. <laughs> Second is to you know, measure the, all the pairwise distances. If you create two random swarms in each class, how different their behavior is. And you can get some statistics from here. And finally, uh, you can create a density function in the you know, feature space, and then we can measure the differential entropy you know, the, of the smoothed version, the continuous function here. So all of them, yeah, yes. All of the measurements try to capture some aspects of the behavior diversity. And then by measuring those, that we, uh, we actually figured out the class D and uh, C and D, the information sharing and the differentiation actually contributes greatly to create a lot more diverse behaviors to the collective level. So it was not simply you know, somewhere between heterogeneous and homogeneous. Indeed, the class as a whole creates a lot more you know, options, so to speak. If you create the self-organizing pattern, having the differentiation, redifferentiation, and the information sharing among the agents, actually they create a much richer evolutionary landscape, so to speak. There are a lot more options that evolution can explore. So that's the conclusion we get from here, right? And the, this is a byproduct. So that's the main, main conclusion up to here at this point, but if you allow the uh, particles to stochastically differentiate, redifferentiate again, to automatically get the, some really interesting feature. It's called self-repair, and I can show you one example, and maybe two examples here. So this is a system that has a stochastic differential feature. So here you have the uh, pattern. I'm going to remove half of the particle now. Now the number is uh, got half. 
but with much smaller system size, it still maintains dynamically the original shape. It's fairly robust. And the second example is even more cruel. So if you don't want to see this, some cruel scene, close your eyes. Right. I'm going to behead this creature. So here you see the green particle. This is, looks like a head. I'm going to take them out, all of them, in a moment. One, two, three. Yes. Okay, sorry. The viewer's discretion is recommended. But now, now you see that they are coming back. Because the, every particle stochastically differentiate to the, each of the types of given by the recipe. So the system is, this is a completely open loop control. There is no feedback. It's really the feed forward uh, system. But the system actually recovers the original shape. So this is also a surprising uh, outcome. We, we didn't even try to achieve this, but it already spontaneously came up. So this is a kind of also nice feature. This never happens if a system is static in terms of types. Right? So having this uh, environment, we tried, OK, is it possible to evolve the interesting pattern? Now that we know that the landscape is very rich, and uh, the, but the question is, what kind of fitness function you should apply? If you want to evolve something computationally, you need to have the preset fitness functions. But in this system, initially we had no idea what kind of fitness function we should use. So instead, we just grab some of as a fitness evaluator, just to let them evolve, you know, the, whatever is interesting, lifelike, cool, whatever, whatever. So here is the one example. This is called hyper-interactive evolution uh, computation we published several years ago. Now we have uh, six different homogeneous particles. Does any of them interest you? Red one? OK. We can choose the red one. OK. We can mix this with uh, some other part, uh, the set of uh, the particles. Any suggestions? This one? OK. We can try that here. And then the mixture shows up here. But in the meantime, there are some boring patterns. We can also kill it. So now, basically, I am the evolution, right? The god of evolution. Oh, you can do that here, right? So I kill this, and then this is boring also. You can also double click to mutate the in terms uh, of the parameter settings. So this way, you can explore what happens if you mix this one to this one. OK? Uh, not so much, right? But you get the idea. The human users are not only the fitness evaluators in this framework, which is typical settings in interactive evolution computation, but rather in this framework, hyper -evol uh, interactive evolution computation, you also decide which way the evolution should move. So this actually allows the, the human user to explore the you know, very high dimensional uh, self-organizing system space uh, more effectively. So we did a lot of fun experiment with this framework. And we created, I mean, this has created some of the very striking patterns like this. I'm running all of them at once. They are all created by the, this interactive evolution computation. This is the creature I showed you. I beheaded this guy. But you also see other patterns. Yeah. My favorite one are this and this. Kind of similar to the old-fashioned the game of life research. I'm not sure if you are familiar. Game of life it always try to find some interesting pattern, and you name it, glider. <laughs> so yeah, this one creates more like a mechanical piston type of behavior, and this one looks like a two boys, you know, playing a catch, right? And it's very difficult to predict how and why this kind of behavior arises. You know, you have the complete set of information. You have exact values for the recipes, but unless you actually conduct simulation in a specific settings, you have no idea why this happens. So anyway, so these are the results of evolution process. Again, none of the particles have any advanced sensors. They are simply following the kinetic interaction. We also use this for the classroom teaching, and the students created lots of patterns here. This is the demonstration of the some of the final results the students created. And they have no idea what they are doing. <laughs> but uh, you see, you know, most of the patterns look quite biological, in fact. right? 
Some of them are more mathematically you know, symmetric. For example, my favorite one is this. This looks like uh, the rotary gear, right? This one is uh, more like a biological one. I have no idea what they collected, but yeah. But you see, the, the, you know, they typically show the multi-layer structure, uh, like a membrane type of structure, and then they tend to create you know, uh, either the dynamic straightforward movement or more like a chaotic random motion or some kind of a rot. This is also creating rotary structure inside it. So you see some behavioral richness you can get from this thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In words. Um, whereas a microscopic property might take you much longer in terms of information because yeah. you need to explain the uh, different types and yeah. the rules and everything. Yeah. But do you agree that that's a very um, standard or, or a very good definition of an emergent property? I wouldn't say it's a good definition. It's more like a you know, very uh, you know, customary definition. People tend to describe emergence that way. And I would actually agree with the core idea that they want to say. But in terms of the core scientific concept, I'm not quite sure if that's a good definition, right? There's certainly the higher level, you know, macroscopic pattern here, right? It's not a ra complete random. So you, there are lots of the, the larger scale features. In that sense, yes, I agree. The description you make at the higher level will be much shorter, which is always true for almost any kind of emergent properties. But uh, if you just say it in natural words, so I, all I can say is that yes, yeah, that makes sense to our everyday life. But uh, when it comes to like, more like a statistical physics, people want to have more quantifiable definition. Yeah. Yes. Here you play with your, your different parameters and so on. But what about finding the appropriate parameters that simulate, for example, star starling swarms or mm -hmm. schools, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. fish schools? Yeah, yeah. In those cases, you know, there are lots of the behavioral ecologists who are doing exactly doing that, right? So what they do is to set up the high definition, high speed camera, keep track of all the three dimensional positions of each individual, and then they try to match the specific parameter values uh, you know, of the use in the computer simulation with the, the actual observation, right? So this one is not try to mimic the behavior of anything real. So that's the, the you know, conceptual difference between those two. No, I understand yeah. that, but yeah. you could look yeah, yeah, in your yeah. space for the appropriate combination exactly. of your yeah. parameters yeah. To, to simulate, yes. the, 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 for example, yeah. starling yeah. Uh, behavior. Yes, absolutely. So in that case, we might be able to actually use standard evolutionary computation because you can actually measure the dif uh, distance between the simulation result and the observed result. Now, you, you know, for example, we already measured several kinetic and the, the topological features, like a 24-dimensional feature space. If we get the similar information from the real collective system, we, try, we can try to evolve from chemistry model to match those features. Absolutely, you could do that, yes. Okay. Anyway, any other questions? So, I, I think I need to wrap things up because here, yeah, maybe ten more minutes, right? So, so finally, because I'm a computer scientist, the ultimate goal is to remove all the human beings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Humans are always the source of the problem, right? And also, of course, they provide solutions. It would be nice if we can create the, you know, the evolutionary system that actually automatically detects the anything interesting and it keeps producing novel patterns. Again, this is not a pure evolutionary computation because we are not optimizing you know, the system for any criteria. Instead, it's more like an open-ended exploratory system. As long as you have a human user, like undergraduate student at Binghamton University trying to evolve it, we are always confined by his or her mindset. But can we come up with the automated system? So here are the, our approaches. We can create the spontaneously you know, evolving the ecosystem or swarm if we know that how to create you know, you know, the designs automatically coming up the, over time. And if we can define some kind of large scale measurements to identify the interesting evolution. This is not about a specific pattern, but rather which conditions are more creative 
in a very large, large, sense, large scale sense. So we did some attempt to create open-ended evolution system. So here's what we did. Okay. So we initially created the, a bunch of empty uh, particles. They don't really have a recipe initially, but you start with some randomly generated recipes, and then when the two particles collide, the information about the behavioral rules, recipe is going to be transmitted from one to the other, right? And then they may actually they change with a very small uh, uh, <clears throat> probability. And here, once the particle receives the recipe information, it randomly differentiates into one of the uh, types, depending on the frequency differences here, like a rule of selection. And here, yeah, I already mentioned uh, the random mutation. And also, the most important thing is that if two particles collide, they both have their recipes. This is like a clash between, right? We need to embed some kind of physics rules. So this is not the, like the fitness evaluation. It's more like, uh, for example, which one was faster? That's the simplest possible. Well, which one is slower? And so the, here we tried a bunch of different lower level physics rules that, that to determine the information flow. Okay. So, so once you get this kind of the basic physics of the information transfer between the particles, you can have this at least spontaneously uh, you know, the evolving system. We are still not quite there yet to detect which conditions is the best. But anyway, so here, and in order to keep the system to continuously produce the more and more, uh, you know, the new types, you need to also perturb the environment occasionally, like the hitting the, uh, you know, giving lightning once in a while, or the, you know, maybe you have some kind of volcano erupting, right, to, <laughs> you know, destroy half of the system and try to repopulate. So that's the way how the, the physical environment keeps the ecosystem active, evolutionarily speaking. So we tried some of the things. And now is the time to quantify how interesting the history of evolution would be. So here is one example. As the consumer of novelty, still till we are the human consumers, we want to entertain ourselves. In order to uh, detect that, which one is more interesting. Just looking at this is the homogeneous random distribution. This one has macroscopic structure. And obviously, as someone who is watching the evolution, we want to see novel morph morphology coming out. So this is one attempt. We can measure the pairwise distances here and there and then compare those two distributions. The, if you, your deviation from the random distribution is great, then that means that it's the, probably the more structured i.e. potentially more interesting evolutionary history. So we use the Kalbach Library divergence of the pairwise distance measurement. So that's the, what we call interestingness or macroscopic structure. It's a dynamical change. So uh, how often new recipes are being produced in every segment of time steps. So in this case, uh, we did some really crappy, cheap approach. Uh, we didn't have this, you know, the data to record all the details of the, of the recipes. We, all we had was just a bitmap image to save our, you know, the storage space. So we just simply counted how many new colors show up. Right? It's a very low level, but still it captures the rate of production of a new uh, recipe pattern. So, so those are two things. Evolutionary exploration levels and the macroscopic structuredness. You can measure this without using any human intervention. Here's the results. The horizontal axis is the evolutionary exploration, i.e. the rate of production of new recipes. The vertical axis is the carbon liver divergence of the pairwise distance, meaning that the higher, the more macroscopic structure. Each dot represents the specific history of evolution. And then here we tried a bunch of different conditions. You don't have to understand what they are. But you see that clearly there is con one condition that is good in both producing structure and producing novelty over time. So we took a look at these patterns, these histories. Are they interesting? And here are the results. Well, you tell me. I, I, I don't know. So we just took the, the best condition, and the simulation actually produces fairly interesting outcomes. Yeah. I have to emphasize, this is not the evolution of computation. In this case, 
it's always just 10,000 particles, no growth, no death. The number of particles are always fixed. The only change that is happening is the information that is housed in each particle. And you see that there are some biological looking behavior. This one is my favorite, but, but for some reason, people love the third one. I don't think the third one is so exciting compared to this one, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, tadpoles. People want to see cute patterns, right? Yeah. That one is cute, but I see that this is more aggressive, and you see a lot more diversification here. Occasionally, you see the dispersal behavior. That's when the lightning strikes, right? And especially in this case, you notice there are actually the continuously they produce a novel patterns. I, I'm going to just wait. Here you see the static pattern also happening, which is kind of interesting, and also there's some the fast movers. But over time, let's see. By the way, you can see the actual movie of this kind of simulation result here in the YouTube channel with some nice music. <laughs> yeah. So I think that the, these uh, results are kind of interesting from our viewpoint. Again, the, we are not really quantifying how interesting each simulation is, but this is the kind of the endorsement, you know, the subjective endorsement that the measurement we used, macroscopic structuredness and evolutionary exploration rate, is successful in finding out which simulation results are actually you know, the more creative, like this. Now those static cluster is gone, and you see the very different pattern coming up. Here you also see the new forms of the life, if you want to say, right? The last one also start to show different forms, a little bit more empty, patterns coming up. So you see that the, the novelty is being produced even without using any uh, specific criteria. And our next goal, if we get any additional funding, is to create the harvesting system from here to trying to capture the meaningful stru micro, uh, mesoscopic structure, try to learn what kind of recipe it was. Yes? Are these uh Samples B, yeah. C, or D? The, uh, in this case, this is D. D. Yeah. Because they are already heterogeneous, right? And then they exchange information when they collide. So, and they differentiate and re differentiate. In this example, it's already the class D. Yeah. And of course, you can remove the information uh, sharing the uh, differentiation. That's really easy. And then pattern is still rich, but they don't really change over time. Right? So it's more like a screensaver. You always see the same pattern. For example, if you love to see this tadpole forever, we can simulate this in class B, right? Class B is heterogeneous, but the static in terms of types. So in that case, you see tadpole all the way, yeah, for the entire future. Ah, that's a good question. So every time I show this video, and some people ask, what happens after this? <laughs> the answer, I have no idea. Luckily or unluckily, I didn't to save the, what it was the random number seed I used for this simulation. It's lost. So if I could recover the random number seed, I should be able to simulate this much longer, and I'm pretty sure the new form is going to continue to appear. But you know, that kind of the, the in, uh, unavailability of information is a key ingredient of life. Because I no longer have the genetic code, so to speak, of this simulation run, I feel this is living. It was living, because I can't re recreate this anymore. It's lost. It's gone. And that's life, right? So anyway. <laughs> OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty much it. The last thing, we also did it 3D. So here, uh, this is the, the same model, but in exactly uh, uh, just change the dimension from 2D to 3D. Surprisingly, it actually works very nicely. Here you see pretty much the same kind of rules. And uh, one thing we discovered was that the, the recipes that you evolve in the two-dimensional settings, most of the time actually works pretty well even in 3D. So this is the, the same creature we beheaded. Right? Changing anything in terms of recipe, I just changed the dimension from 2D to 3D, and it still works. So. This kind of swarm-based system is very robust against the dimensional changes. This is very unlikely for any other complex systems models, like a cell automata or networks. They have you know, a significant 
dependence on the spatial dimension, but this doesn't. And uh, finally, however, this is my last conclusion. In terms of evolution, 3D sucks. It, for some reason, yeah, 2D is much better at the creating novelty than 3D. And then we have the hypothesis. This is probably because of the statistical physics knowledge. You know, random movement is, you know, it creates a much more frequent collision if you are doing it in 2D. But if you expand it 3D, the probability for the particle to come back to the same position or two particles to collide is fundamentally lower. Evolution requires collision interaction, that's why. So another interpretation here is that that's probably why life always appears on the surface of the planet. We could have the life emerging in the vast space, you know, like astronomically large uh, creature, but this never happens. Probably because it has to be confined in two million spaces. So that's pretty much it. So we explored several different complex classes of the collective systems. Uh, each model assumption has a huge impact on self-organization. And you can also create uh, self-repair and uh, you know, behavioral uh, diversity. And interactive and automated evolution helps design novel patterns. Right? And finally, it works on 3D, but not quite in terms of evolution. Right? If you want to find more information, there's the project website here. And thank you very much.